Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar on the future of social stock exchange. Uh, before we begin, I have two requests from all of you. Uh, if you could rename yourselves uh, with the name, uh, I mean, your name, as well as followed by the, the organization that you belong to in the brackets, uh, because this will help, help us understand if you're asking any questions, if you're having any perspectives or experiences that you would like to share with us on the chat box. Um, and additionally, as well, if you're not able to come back to, if you're not able to answer any questions on chat box as well, or through the course of this conversation, it will help us just get back to you later on on email or so. So that's the first request that I would have, just similar to how Hemant Gupta or I have done it, just your name followed by the name of your organization. Um, second request, if, if you have any perspectives drawing from your experiences or any questions that you might have during the course of the conversation, if you can just drop it in the chat box over here. Uh, my colleagues, Rini and Shreya Singh, uh, will do their best to answer your questions on the chat box itself. But at the same time, they'll be relaying the questions uh, to me and Hemant here uh, that we may not be able to you know, cover during the first half of the discussions as well. We have reserved the last half an hour for uh, Q&As. Uh, but throughout the discussions as well, if there are any perspectives, experiences that you would like to share, please keep uh, dropping them uh, on the chat box. Uh, so those are just two requests uh, from my side uh, before we begin. To introduce myself, uh, I'm Lekia. Uh, I currently anchor the Capital for uh, Impact Practice Area at Satwa Knowledge Institute, SKI for short. Um, while I'm sure that a lot of you here are friends of Satwa and SKI and know about us, but for those who don't, uh, Satwa is a social impact consulting firm and we're driven by our mission to end poverty in our lifetime. But to make this happen, we work with a wide range of stakeholders, and this includes corporates, philanthropists, foundation, nonprofits, and for profit organizations. And with them, we develop scalable solutions as well as maximize the return of their financial and non financial investments as well. We offer end to end support covering needs assessment, research, program design, program design and management, all the way to monitoring evaluation. And we have our own data and technology products as well. But in 2002, uh, we at Satwa actually launched a very exciting milestone uh, in our journey called Satwa Knowledge Institute. Um, and our aim at SKI is to curate and provide evidence-backed uh, and rigorous knowledge as a tool to influence stakeholders and to enable stakeholders to make their decisions across various sectors. We have six practice areas across uh, SKI now. We have sectoral, uh, sector-focused practice areas, health, agriculture, livelihoods, and education, as well as two cross-cutting ones called digital platforms and capital for impact. Um, since our launch in uh, 2022, um, with a team of 40 plus members, we have published about 100 plus products with full public access. Uh, we invite you to look through uh, some of our products, uh, so far ranging all the way from primers to full to long form written perspectives, as well as podcasts that uh, call Decoding Impact. I'm pasting the link uh, over here as well for everyone's reference, the link to our website, as well as the link to uh, Satwa Knowledge Institute if all of you want to go through our products as well. But in the meantime, the practice area that I lead called Capital for Impact, uh, we aim to draw from Satwa's decade long experience of working in the private philanthropic landscape. And combining the tacit knowledge that we are carrying with the ground up research driven insights to influence shift intent and as well as align different types of philanthropic capital towards key developmental gaps and as well as enable innovative solutions. So far, we're working on three focus areas on developing knowledge products and driving these conversations. Uh, one of them being strategic CSR, second being effective philanthropy and third being blended finance, which is also what we're gonna to touch upon during today's conversation. Um, that's a little bit about SKI um, and Satwa. With, I'm personally very thrilled to have Hemant Gupta sir here today uh, to help us understand the role of social stock exchange, in fact, as a catalyst in the ecosystem, and also firsthand hear from him what the future of social stock exchange would also look like. Given some of the new members have joined us now, I would like to welcome each and every one of you as well. Uh, we understand your time is valuable, and we truly appreciate your presence here today. Um, whether you're a seasoned expert in the development sector and have kept track of SSE since it was mooted in 2019, or new to the concept of social stock exchange as well, if you have any insights, any queries, please keep dropping them in the chat box uh, as we keep proceeding through the conversation. 
a quick introduction about uh, Heman Gupta over here. Um, Heman Gupta, sir, currently leads uh, SSC at PSC. He's also a member of the Working Committee and Technical Group uh, constituted by uh, SEBI for setting up the Social Stock Exchange, as well as the Managing Director of BRT SIF, which is a technology incubator at SSC. He's also taken over the helm of uh, BSE's tech incubator called Zone Startups in India and is actively leading several accelerator programs, including Empower, which is India's first woman-focused startup entrepreneur. He has, he, after spending 26 years at Citibank across a wide range of functions, he decided to swap uh, from a large corporate role into a more socially impactful role. Um, so Heman Gupta said, I mean, this is the introduction that you had given to me, but I think what I would love to know what the participants here would love to know, and as well as we also have a lot of college students here, uh, you know, from a lot of institutes. So would love to know your journey all the way from Citibank to the development sector, you know, from BSE Samman to BRTSIF to now SSC, and also understand from you what have been your personal takeaways, you know, through this journey into development sector. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you, Nikhil, for the kind words. And uh, hello, everybody. I can see some of you can probably take this webinar instead of me from some of the names that I've seen or people have joined. And also some of you are registered and uh, I think the first listing, the, uh, that NGO is also there as a part of this webinar. So thank you very much for being a part of the journey. Uh, uh, take care of your question. So 2016 is when I decided to switch from uh, Citibank to B what BSC Samman uh, with the objective of uh, doing something more socially useful with my life. And uh, that was early days of CSR and I was uh, fortunate enough to be a part of that journey. Um, the, uh, the addition of the incubator, those startups or BRTSIF, also lended uh, to my, uh, uh, it also lended the for-profit lens to social development, of course, also not, uh, not for profits also. And then social talk exchange, of course, rounds off that experience very well. And uh, what my key takeaways uh, from uh, these seven odd years of social development experience uh, has been one, the fact that uh, social development journey is a heart-driven journey more than a head-driven journey, although it's changing rapidly, especially with more uh, sophisticated areas such as blended finance. Uh, I think CSR was a key catalyst in pushing that along. And now with blended finance, a lot of that is happening. But effective social impact still requires the heart in the right place. Uh, the second has been that uh, and this, a lot of people in the social development sector sometimes find hard to uh, digest, but measurement is important, right? Whatever you may say, uh, measurement is important. And once again, I think social stock exchange will act as a catalyst in moving the needle on that one. And uh, the the one thing that uh, the one thing that I I was struck by, especially around the blended finance, some of the more structured finance initiatives in the social development sector was that it still is a small uh, portly of people who are engaged in it, both from the issuer side, the donor side, and the investor side. So I'm very, very hopeful that the social stock exchange will uh, you know, spur that movement along and democratize the whole thing. Uh, there's tons, I, I, like I keep telling people, these seven years, I think I've learned more than I learned in the 26 years that went before that. So, there, I mean, we can have a, a separate session on this. But for today's session, I will mean, keep it at that, yeah? No, I'm, I'm sure that, you know, you've had a remarkable journey through different sectors, taking up different roles, you know, exploring, also going through different unique challenges and also, you know, opportunities, right? And the journey that you've gone through and the opportunities that you've created in the ecosystem, especially through social stock exchanges, massive. Um, thank you for your introduction, sir. And to just kickstart uh, the discussion as well, uh, for everyone's reference too, we're going to divide the session into three smaller parts. 
Uh, the first part, what uh, Dr. H Doc what Himan Gupta sir and I'm going to try to do is to sort of lay down the foundation to our discussion based on the questions that we have received uh, from all of you today. Um, some of these questions majorly were around how is philanthropy shifting in India? And secondly, what do we mean by catalytic? Uh, because that's also in the topic of today's discussion as well. And third, um, Heyman sir would also be coming in and giving us some understanding of uh, the SEC uh, learnings globally. What's the eligibility criteria? What, do, what is the registration process and various instruments as well? The second part of the discussion, uh, we will focus on the potential of SEC to bring in efficiency in the impact ecosystem, as well as what the future of uh, SEC is going to look like. And in the last 30 minutes, we are just going to reserve good amount of time for Q&A, uh, you know, and gather questions from all of you. And also we'll keep a track of any questions that's coming over the first one hour as well and ensure we're covering that answering those uh, through towards the end. Um, to start off with, on the first point, I'm just going to share my screen and uh, walk you all through a quick deck uh, that we have put together based on Capital for Impact's work so far, and as well as Satwa's uh, experience uh, in this space as well. Um, firstly, I mean, understanding the size of philanthropy in India before even understanding that is, we all know that civil society and for-profits in India are working tirelessly uh, to bring about transformational change, where they're trying to ensure that the growth and the opportunities are more fairly distributed across communities and regions. But at the same time, we've seen a rapid growth of philanthropic community in India as well, both in terms of the increase in private sector funding, which as you can see over here has totaled to almost 60K crores, 60,000 crores in 2022. And also in terms of the diversification uh, of this uh, funding size, right? In the form of instruments, in the form of approaches and different practices of philanthropy. We're now seeing organizations investing and working in high need underserved areas. And this includes geographically and sectorally as well. And making their investments more output, uh, outcome and impact oriented and also collaborative led uh, to ensure that the change that they're making is large scale population systemic change. The pandemic has also triggered a rise in collaboration, you know, among civil society actors, funders, and government to co-create solutions and tackle the socio-economic challenges that happen during and even after, you know, also to, uh, to also to ensure that the ramifications are being reduced. Uh, but as you can see over here, uh, you know, majority of uh, the philanthropy landscape in India comes from the domestic family philanthropy, which constitutes 50%, followed by the CSRs, which is 45%, as well as the formal giving, uh, which is individual giving from folks like you and I, uh, which constitutes 5%. We have not accounted for informal giving over here since those numbers are very difficult to estimate. So we looked at formal giving over here that comes from Satwa's study from Everyday Giving with uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation a few years ago. And this, this 60K crore private philanthropy in India in 2022 have seen a 12% growth year on year, right? And if you were to assume the same conservative growth over the next five years as well will reach one lakh crore by 2027. And accumulatively, we are looking at five lakh crore, uh, you know, over the next five years. And this is the funding size that if it becomes catalytic, you know, it has a chance to unlock more and more capital. And coming to why there's a need for it to be catalytic as well. And we all know that public sector has been carrying the weight of social sector spending in India which accounts for 95% of total spending. Uh, but despite this progress, uh, we're well short of our Niti Aayog's estimate also of uh, meeting SDGs. And that's almost by, in 2022, we face a 7.7 .7 lakh crore deficit. And this is estimated to be about 12.4 lakh crore uh, in FY27. And with government financials also likely to be moderated to its pre-pandemic levels, the imperative remains on private philanthropy to actually play a catalytic role in closing this funding gap. Um, and philanthropy is evolving, right? Like they're completely reimagining their role uh, in India. And like I was saying before, they're seeking more structured and informed giving and engaging in newer and newer social impact uh, investments, such as retail giving, venture philanthropy, innovative financing solutions, et cetera, to tap into different sources of funding for long-term financing and also to ensure that the social impact ecosystem is being strengthened over the long term. Um, and what do we mean by catalytic, right? Now that we have spoken about the size of philanthropy in India, the need to be catalytic, 
Uh, Satwa's experience has seen the evolution of philanthropy across three uh, levers. Um, and philanthropy is increasingly being used uh, in a more catalytic manner, in fact, across these three lenses. One mainly is the nature of the problem, uh, nature of the capital that is needed, uh, which, which to put in very simpler terms, is the various instruments that can be used. Second is the journey of the philanthropic capital itself. When should it be deployed? At what stages? And when should it exit? Uh, and this is ties back to the journey of the problem itself and the problem to be solved. Um, and in, if we were to break down each of these axes and the lenses down, um, and first talk about the problem to be solved itself. Here we have used the Donella Meadows Systems Change Framework uh, that helps us look at leverage points for different philanthropic actors uh, in this ecosystem. In the past, almost 90% of the funding was going towards improving capacity and capability buildings of individuals. But over recent times, increased focus and efforts have been going towards other systemic uh, shift levers, such as uh, encouraging development of public platforms, you know, supporting research and innovation, uh, increase collaboration, equity and stakeholder engagement with ensuring that power sharing processes are in place, as well as improving the policies and the government institutions in the ecosystem. And lastly, also influencing the leadership mindset and causing a paradigm shift. We've noticed how while 90% of the funding was down below, now it's slowly a part of this funding is moving up up, up, and towards influencing uh, the systemic levers here as well. But if we were to talk about when, uh, sorry, I missed the slide, but we, if we were to also talk about when the capital uh, should be um, deployed as well. Um, here we see that, um, that philanthropic capital is increasingly coming in, provide viability gap funding wherein other actors may see limit, very limited uh, involvement or lower involvement. And these philanthropic uh, actors who are boldly supporting and filling in this viability gap seek to prove the designs and the solutions that might seem risky for the ecosystem. And here, this is where the example of blended finance that Human Sir was referring to also comes in, is to fill in this uh, gap to viability. And finally, we see that philanthropy exists uh, when the mainstream private sector and the government play get stronger to solve the problem. And as we move forward, this also gets tied to the nature of the capital that needs to be deployed as well. Uh, we see that uh, the nature of philanthropic and mainstream private capital get, that gets channelized um, is based on the market and the state response uh, towards the problem that needs to be solved. And to break down each of these types, seed fund typically comes in when the ecosystem is unsure of whether a problem is a state failure or a market failure. And the, the fund from the philanthropists actually comes in to uh, fund bold entrepreneurs with very bold ideas and solutions. Then as we move forward, the markets needs to see the viability and the state needs to understand whether the, solu whether the solutions can be implemented or not. And that's where venture debt potentially comes in which serves as a strategic tool to complement the equity financing. And the, this is a stage where potentially pilots could be conducted you know, to establish proof of concept. The third step, uh, which is where blended finance ideally comes in, is when the state sees viability and gives its implementation abilities to philanthropy. And the market also sees or seeks incentives you know, while, prob while solving this problem. And blended finance becomes then a very strategic model that helps in unlocking greater developmental finance. Uh, by the private sector towards uh, the development sector while providing financial returns to the investors as well. And the risk is also shared uh, you know, equally among them all. And lastly is when we see philanthropy exiting, uh, when either the state becomes a huge implementer or when the solutions make actually commercial or financial sense for the mainstream capital uh, providers to take on. So this is, uh, I would say, capital for impacts perspective on what we mean by, uh, you know, philanthropy becoming catalytic in nature now and how it's being evolved uh, as we move forward. But I also just want to spend some time, given we'll be talking about blended finance more and more uh, through this conversation, there would be questions coming in on this as well. I'd like to just spend five minutes talking about uh, and laying down just some foundational understanding of blended finance as well. Um, I mean, mainstream market, private capital has a huge potential in India to bridge the investment gap 
but as some of us already know private investors appear very reluctant you know and this is owing to potential risk um, and also low returns in developing the sector projects and for some private players who have not been in development sector it also leads to more apprehensions at their side because of limited knowledge in markets and familiarity with the sector and also challenging investment climate uh, but through blended finance models philanthropic capital is increasingly now being used to enable development investments appear very attractive to private investors when private investors when they invest with an aim to uh, earn returns and also proof of the intervention and at the same time philanthropic actors are also able to absorb uh, the risk of that investment but why blended finance right i mean uh, why are we even talking about this in the first place is because blended finance has a potential to channelize philanthropic and commercial capital to solve social problems while benefiting all sorts of stakeholders involved and there are other advantages including de-risking investments you know as opposed to a traditional grant funding model where there's upfront deployment of funds blended finance programs are impact based and thus they ensure the maximization of social return by de-risking investments but at the same time it increases the leverage uh, through effective use of capital and there are multiple instruments i mean we've been able to identify 14 plus instruments of which you know we we found instruments that either recycle capital or are able to unlock further commercial and private capital which enables a multiplier effect when it comes to unlocking capital as well as in scaling social impact and lastly it enables effective collaboration you know facilitating because in blended finance model there are a lot of players coming together from diverse uh, players coming together private philanthropic government at times and this facilitates effective philan- uh, effective collaboration uh, between these different stakeholders in the ecosystem and what this also helps in is bringing multiple expertise you know from different people and you know these different stakeholders being able to play complementary roles um not that we've spoken about the size of philanthropy in india and the role of philanthropy you know and why it needs to be catalytic and as well as talking about blended finance um i am now going to hand it over to uh, himant gupta sir to also talk about how social stock exchange can act as a catalyst uh in this ecosystem and when i say that sir i mean it has a huge potential like all of us know in bringing together non profits for profit social enterprise uh, enterprises as well as this catalytic donors and investors who are willing to take these bigger risks um here i mean here we only spoke about the 60k crore going to the develop, development sector but there's also a, there's also a huge amount of funding that's going from pvc firms for example towards you know for profit enterprises as well and through your presentation would also love to know what your learnings have been from ssc's globally and how those learnings have been incorporated into uh, you know india's design as well in addition to the eligibility criteria the registration process um and i think by the end of this discussion as well it will help us have a very good foundational common ground uh you know to also have further future discussions so with this i'm just going to hand it over to you sir thank you lekha uh, what i'll do is i'll share my screen is my screen visible yes yes okay. it is so what we'll do is uh, we'll actually start with the basics of what the indian social stock exchange looks like and like lekha said lay it out in the context of what's been done in the world before what from an ngo perspective uh, it means to be coming on to the social stock exchange what's the process what are the additional considerations and then finally uh, 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 we talk about how blended finance or other instruments can play a role and why is the social stock exchange important in that context so what i'll do is and some of you have seen this presentation before so what i'll do is i'll start by doing a quick history of the social stock exchange um right and probably most of you know the journey started in india in july 2019 um with an announcement by the honorable finance minister during her the interim budget of the announced of a social stock exchange and two things that i'd like to point out in this announcement the first is it said under the regulatory ambit of the securities and exchange board of india sebi 
and the second is for listing of social enterprises and voluntary organizations. SEBI, as uh, you guys may know, is the regulator that's responsible for the stock exchanges in India, both BSC and NSC. And therefore, uh, uh, it would lend a stock exchange-like framework to the Indian Social Stock Exchange. And the second is that social enterprises, which by which she meant for-profit social enterprises and voluntary organizations, which are not for-profit social enterprises, both should be included in the purview of this Indian Social Stock Exchange. Right now, uh, before we talk about why those things are important, let's take a step back and look at how this experiment has happened in other countries. A total of 13 countries have rolled out a social stock exchange. On your screen, you see seven of the more important ones that happened. Right, the ones in green are the ones that are still functioning. The ones in red are the ones that uh, are either not functioning or, or for all, all intents and purposes defunct. The way you read each of these boxes it is uh, the first is the name of the country, Canada. In, if you look at my cursor, Canada on the left side. Uh, 2013 is the year in which, which it was launched. SVX is the name of that social stock exchange. And whether it's for for-profit enterprises or not for-profit enterprises. And you'll quickly realize that the ones that are surviving are the ones that cater to for-profit enterprises, right? Um, also, structurally, the other social stock exchanges also had some key differences. For the first is that they were all separate stock exchanges. They were not integrated into the country stock exchanges that existed in those countries. Uh, like I pointed out earlier, the issuers or the people raising funds could be NPOs or for-profit enterprises, not-for-profit organizations or for-profit enterprises. There was uh, none or very little trading that happened on these platforms, and the countries are given, right? Now, so this... Uh, Keep this in mind when I talk about the Indian Stock Exchange, Social Stock Exchange, because when we were going about uh, designing or architecting the Indian Social Stock Exchange, some of these considerations were kept in mind. Now let's go back to the history. So how did it all start? It started out by creating of a working committee in September 2019, and in about nine months, it came out with a report uh, the objective of the working committee is essentially to work the architecture out, right? The big picture of how the Indian social stock exchange works. That the baton was then handed over to the technical group in September 2020, uh, where the, the technical group actually got into the details of the processes related to the Indian social stock exchange, right? And both these groups, the working committee as well as the technical group, kept the global lessons in mind. And finally, uh, last year in July is when the government started coming out with notifications, enabling the launch of the Indian Social Stock Exchange. Um, and just a quick note on where we are today um, on the Indian, in the Indian scenario. So uh, after July, 2022, uh, we at BSC applied to open this segment uh, in August. And the final approval after a lot of due diligence, et cetera, came in last week of December. NSC got their approval in February of this year. And since then, we have uh, about 27 uh, NPOs registered on the BSC and a similar number on NSC. <laughs> okay. So let's spend a little bit of time talking about what the working committee and the technical group did before we get into the architecture of the social stock exchange. Okay, so both these groups, the working committee as well as the technical group, came out with reports that were 70 plus pages uh, big and contained a lot of knowledge. Um, but what I've done is for, the, for this uh, discussion, I've summarized the key points uh, that uh, are there in these documents. And I'll also talk about why they're important. Right? So the working committee 
three key points I wanted to mention. One is SSC will be a segment under the existing stock exchanges, namely BSC and NSE. Remember what I said about the other stock exchanges? They were all separate platforms. Why is this important? This is important because over the course of the last few decades, the, these uh, SEBI as well as the stock exchanges have fine-tuned the ecosystem for fundraising and trading in securities. And it is important that we leverage that framework to build a foundation, a trustworthy foundation for the social stock exchange. Second, set up a capacity building fund to build the ecosystem. Again, this is important because for most of the social development sector, a stock exchange is an enigma, right? They don't really understand how the stock market works. So therefore it was important that a fund be created whose main objective is to actually um, um, educate, build awareness, educate and help uh, NGOs in particular uh, uh, take advantage of the social stock exchange but equally importantly, educate donors and investors on why the social stock exchange has to be a key part of their asset allocation. Okay. The third uh, was the introduction of a zero coupon, zero principle instrument, right? A zero coupon, zero principle instrument is nothing but a donation or a grant, which has been renamed into an instrument. There are three things that I want to mention here. One is, the reason why we had to create a zero coupon, zero principle instrument is the stock exchange requires uh, anything that gets listed to be an instrument as defined in uh, an act of parliament. So it was important for us to create an instrument. Second, for all intents and purposes, this is a donation or a grant. So even from an accounting point of view, it will be treated as a donation or a grant. Third, this is an instrument, not a bond or a debenture and therefore does not mean repayment of principal. Right? This question keeps coming up often, so I thought I'll uh, clarify up front. It is a donation or a grant. So the technical group took the work that had been done by the working committee and uh, detailed that into a series of processes. Right? Uh, the first thing that happened was that in India today, there is no definition of what is a social enterprise. There's no legal definition. So the first thing we had to do is create a criteria that would serve as a precondition for any enterprise, not for profit or for profit, for coming onto the social stock exchange. Right. The second was for people who, who are familiar with the stock exchange, any company that's listed on the stock exchange has to make frequent disclosures about their performance about any key events that are happening. Okay. However, a social enterprise does something over and above what a normal commercial enterprise does. It also creates a social impact. So as a part of the disclosures that any enterprise coming onto the social stock exchange has to do, for the purposes of people who subscribe to them, they also have to make impact-related disclosures. Third, it is important that for a person looking for good avenues to donate their money or invest their money into social enterprises, that there is a third party validation of their track record. And therefore, a role of a social auditor or a social assessor for validation of what the enterprise is saying their impact has been. And the fourth is uh, something called a social venture fund uh, which uh, you can think of it as a um, as a mutual fund of um, uh, uh, underlying instruments, uh, which enables people to contribute to not just one particular project, but actually participate just like a mutual fund allows you to participate in the growth of multiple companies at one. Uh, a social venture fund would allow, create a basket which would allow you to also participate in creating an impact through multiple initiatives, okay? And during the deliberations, of course, we consulted with the a whole host of stakeholders from the social development sector, right? 
Now, what all of this did was that uh, it helped us create the broad architecture. Okay, and you see this on your screen, and I'll keep coming back to this slide as we go through our discussion. Like I mentioned, step one, establish primacy of social intent. And we'll talk about what that means. Once you've established yourself to be a social enterprise as per our criteria, then if uh, you're for-profit enterprise, you would actually go down the path of SPE list, security listing on the right-hand side. And here, two things are important. One is that if you're looking to issue equity or debt, right, which is you want to do an IPO or you want to issue debentures or bonds, then you would follow the existing norms of how any other commercial enterprise would raise money through equity or debt. We did not uh, re uh, recreate anything there because we already have processes and systems that work very well and have stood the test of time. But a for-profit also additionally can uh, create mutual funds, social venture funds, or social development bonds. And between myself and Lakia, we'll spend some time on some of these alternate instruments and their uh, role in this whole story. Uh, switch back to the left side, the NPO side. Here we had to do a lot more work because as you're aware, a not for for profit organization before the introduction of the social stock exchange did not have any role to play in the stock exchange ecosystem. So the approach we adopted here was that mostly uh, NPOs raise funds at a program or a project level, and therefore, uh, can we break up the or process for an NPO into two parts? You register once, you register the organization once. And then you raise funds as many times as you want, either through the zero coupon zero principle instrument that I referred to earlier, or through other instruments like SPF and SIF. One thing that I do want to mention here, uh, these instruments in the bottom row that you see are, uh, are more for uh, demonstration purposes. One of the key things that the stock exchange allows you to do is actually be innovative in terms of how you want to do your fundraising through blended finance, venture debt, all those other things that Lick has spoke about. Right, so these are just representative ways of raising funds. We can work out far more innovative structures also. So what we'll do now is spend a little bit of time on how each of these boxes work. And for the purposes of the initial discussion, we'll focus on the left side. Right, that's where most of the action has been also so far. Okay, so step one, establish primacy of social intent. Three big filters and one preferential filter. Big filters are 17 broad areas. These broad areas, and I'll go quickly to these broad areas. They're on your screen right now. Uh, you'll notice most of them are uh, on Schedule 7, the CSR Act. Uh, there are some SDG goals. There are some ETI priority areas, but there are also some new ones like, uh, you know, number 15, bridging the digital divide, uh, 16, promoting welfare of migrants and displaced workers. So we tried to make it as pertinent as possible to today's, uh, today's environment, right? So step one, you have to be working in one or more of these 16 areas. Step two. It's not enough for you to be just dabbling in one of the more of those areas. You have to do two thirds of your work in those or sixty seven percent of your work in those areas. And the sixty seven percent is can be measured either in terms of revenue, which is typically for a for profit enterprise, or expenses, which is typically for an NPO, or even beneficiaries. So, for example, a lot of uh, uh, NPOs work with volunteers. Reflected on their exchange statements. So then uh, look at the beneficiaries and see if the beneficiaries are coming from um, underserved or less privileged segments. The third, so those were enabling uh, filters. The third is actually a disabling filter where four categories of organizations have initially been barred. Those with political or religious affiliations is the first. The second is corporate foundations or foundations that 
uh, rely on a corporate parent body for a bulk of their funding. The idea here was that at least initially, if you can open the uh, entities that don't have already have committed uh, funding sources, you let others participate in the fund raising through the social stock exchange. Third uh, category that was barred is professional or trade bodies like uh, CII or FICI or you know, ECCI uh, entities like that. And last but not the least, infrastructure and housing companies except those in affordable housing segments, right? So these four categories cannot uh, register or cannot enter the social stock exchange. And of course, uh, the, uh, the enterprise shall target underserved or less privileged population segments or regions. Okay, so what have we done? We've covered the first box. And if you pass that filter, then you're ready to enter the social stock exchange. And like I mentioned earlier, we'll start with the left side because the right side is, uh, is an established process. Okay. So first, as an NPO, what is the basic eligibility criteria that you need to meet? And again, this will look familiar to most of you from the NPO side. Must be a society trust or section with three years. Must have a track record of three years. Have a valid 12A, 12A, et cetera, registration. Have a valid ATG. Uh, and two more criteria was added. One was a size criteria, a minimum of 50 lakhs of annual spending in the last financial year. Why this is important is that Remember, I spoke about the impact related disclosures, but there are other disclosures. So there are certain compliances and disclosures which any entity entering the social stock exchange has to comply with. And therefore should have the resources to be able to meet those requirements and hence a size criteria. Second, uh, a stock exchange intrinsically does not raise funds for you, right? So as an example, if your NPO name is ABC, the stock exchange will not approach potential donors or investors and say, listen, ABC has a zero coupon zero principle. Why don't you put money into it? Stock exchange is a neutral platform that is the same for all people who want to raise money and all people who want to give money. Therefore, the organization has to have a basic, uh, a basic capability of fundraising, so I must have raised a minimum of 10 lakh funds. So if your organization or NPO meets this criteria, then register on BSC or NSC. For BSC, the process is given on your screen. Essentially, to log, go to our portal, register your interest, we will come back to you three business days. And with login details, you can upload the documentation. The documentation essentially is to go back two slides, right? One is documentation that uh, 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 documentation of incorporation to show you're a society, a trust, a section eight company, income tax returns for three years, track record, et cetera, et cetera. But also certificates that from your chartered accountants that show that you are passing this criteria also. So what we did at BSC is we crunched the two steps, this and this together for NPOs. So you don't have to go through two processes. You have to go through one process only. Right? And we would come back to you with any clarifications, any doubts, uh, and then you uh, uh, would uh, upload additional documentation or amended documentation. And once everything is hunky-dory, we would uh, register you. And we have 27 NPOs which are currently registered on the so on BSC. Yeah. Oh yeah. One other. Sorry, I believe. Um... No, sorry, I yeah. just had a yeah. <clears throat> no, I see. Go ahead. So uh, one other thing. Uh, the registration fee for BSC is 5,000 rupees plus GST. Now that you're registered, um, uh, you can now do a zero coupon, raise money. And that the process is very simple again. <clears throat> you send us an email uh, saying you want to raise funds. 
and we'll come back to you with the toolkit for the documentation that required. I'll talk a little more, bit more about the documentation in the next slide, but the core of that documentation is something called an offer document, uh, which is similar to a proposal that you would put together. But apart from all the legal stuff that needs to go into any fundraise that happens on the uh, on a stock exchange, basically has what are the objectives, timelines, budgets, beneficiaries, etc. Okay. Um, uh, the uh, okay, so here so currently a zero coupon zero principal instrument has the following characteristics: minimum amount you can raise is one crore, right? Minimum amount a donor can give is two lakhs. Issue has to be in DMAT form only, and minimum issue subscription required is seventy five percent. What do we? What do these things mean? So minimum issue size, I presume, is obvious that your project, the funds you're looking to raise has to be a minimum one crore. What, what we recommend is this one crore should not just be your project implementation cost, but should also include all the costs associated with uh, doing the issue on the stock exchange. So as an example, uh, the stock exchange uh, requires uh, you to pay a listing fee of 25,000 rupees per issue. Uh, another example is that in putting together all that documentation for enabling the listing, you may need help of various uh, people, legal people, chartered accountants, etc. Right? There's an ongoing cost of compliance, etc. So all of that social audit cost, or our recommendation is all of that should be in your, uh, uh, you know, the fund that you're raising for the project, so that uh, it doesn't have to come out of your corpus. That's point number one. Point number two is that we have gone back to SEBI and said that one crore perhaps may be a little high. So in September, SEBI had actually come out with a consultation paper looking to uh, lower that limit to 50 lakhs. And they have received a favorable response. We will see when they come out with the amended uh, ruling. Second, minimum subscription amount of two lakhs, which basically means that any donor wanting to give money to the zero coupon zero principle has to give a minimum of two lakhs. This comes from SEBI's definition of what is called a non institutional investor. And again, we've gone back and said that donations, uh, especially for individuals, two lakhs will be way too high. So they have looked at a lower limit of also there in that consultation paper. Again, has they have received favorable responses of lowering that limit. So we shall hear soon from uh, SEBI on that. Third issue has to be in DMAT form only. What this means is that um, basically any security shares or bonds, etc., on the stock exchange are no longer issued as certificates or paper based, right? They all are electronic issues. It's like uh, you know having a bank account that can hold shares, if you want to call it that. So every investor on the stock exchange has to have a DMAT account, an account in which uh, when they buy, purchase a security, their units that they purchase can be transferred to, and when they sell it, can be taken out of that account and handed over to the party who's buying. Similarly, for a zero coupon zero principal instrument, uh, the donor or investor has to open a DMAT account if they don't have one already. Uh, and there's a process that needs to be followed from the fundraising side uh, to be able to use a DMAT account. Fourth, uh, on the social stock exchange, so let's say if you have an issue of one crore, Minimum issue subscription required means at least 75 lakhs have to be subscribed to, or that much fund has to be raised for the issue to be successful. So if you raise less than 75%, then you have to refund the money to the people who have given it. If you raise between 75 and 100%, uh, which means that uh, you uh, have... Uh, so in our case of one crore, between 75 lakhs and one crore, um, then your issue is successful. I can, you can proceed 
with the issue. And if you raise more than 100% or your issue has been oversubscribed, then you do a proportionate allotment. So for example, if you had an issue of one crore and you actually received two crores worth of subscriptions or donations, then each person who donated will get half of their units, right? So if they had uh, donated as an example, 10 lakhs, they would actually, the five lakhs would be returned and five lakhs would be considered as a subscription to that ZCZ. Okay. And of course, the zero coupon zero principle, remember it's a donation or a grant. So it doesn't have any, uh, any amount that needs to be returned at the end of the project. So as in when the project terminates, the objectives have been achieved, it will be terminated and it of a zero value. Okay. All right. So that was a brief on zero coupon zero principle instruments. Uh, a, a few words on social auditors because they, with the social stock exchange, have become an intrinsic part of the process. Social auditors or social assessors are not chartered accountants, don't have to be chartered accountants, sorry. Right? But they essentially do an audit of social impact. So if in your offer document, you have stated that I will create such and such uh, impact through my project, they will do a periodic assessment of whether that is being achieved or not. Social auditor is a qualified certified entity person the way you get certified is uh, there's, a, there's an organization called NISM, National Institute of Securities Markets, which is a training body for the stock exchanges. They have launched an 11 module course with a certification. Exam. The number of people who have passed now has crossed 1,500. Uh, and this is slightly old information. It's probably grown by now. Now, any any uh, because the social auditors play such an important role in this whole creating transparency around this in the social stock exchange, it was important that there's a code of conduct and there's a discipline that these people follow and there are no malpractices. So also there has been there's a self SRO, self regulatory organization has been set up for social auditors. The, there's one currently under the Chartered Accountant Institute called ISAI, and there are further ones proposed by I, the Company Security Institute and the Management Accountant Institute, uh, which essentially you empanel yourself, register, they lay down standards of professional conduct, uh, suspension, cancellation in case of uh, malpractices, a code of conduct for the social auditors, as well as prescribed social audit standards uh, why are standards important? Because they help in comparing project to project. So if as a donor, you want to look at two similar projects and decide which one you should subscribe to, you have to be able to compare uh, the, their audit reports to make sure that uh, you're comparing apples and apples, not apples and oranges. And uh, there have been standards that have been defined by all the entities that are in interested in having a, a SRO. I'm hoping that these standards eventually will come together and we'll have one standard. It doesn't make sense having separate standards. Okay. So that's briefly what I had. I'm going to now hand it back to Rekhya, then continue the conversation around some of the other aspects related to the social stock exchange. Back to you, Rekhya. No, absolutely. Uh, so I think this answers a lot of questions that I think we received uh, you know, through the Q&A form, I think before the webinar as well. Uh, I know you've also spoken about, uh, you know, uh, organizations have already registered on uh, social stock exchange, but has this listing uh, begun yet? You know, has there been a nonprofit who has gone through the process uh, already? It was just, uh, you know, one question I think I also saw on the chat and also a question that I had. Um, so uh, there are 27 NPOs that are registered on BSC. There's a similar number also, and there's some common ones. Obviously, we have uh, 60 odd unique NGOs that are registered. Uh, there is one entity that has received simple approval for their listing, and their issue should open shortly. Uh, that's uh, SGBS, and I think SGBS is a part of the audience here. Um, so, congratulations. And uh, they, um, 
there are two or three, I know of at least two more that are in the pipeline. And all of these are, uh, uh, the all of these are uh, ZC, ZP so far. We are also working on a couple of social impact bonds, but I think it's still early days for that particular instrument. Got it. So just before we uh, go ahead, your voice is going in and out. So oh. I just, yeah. So we're missing out a couple of parts of what okay. you're saying. If you just give me 15 seconds, I'll put on my headphones. Yeah. Sure, that's absolutely fine. Uh, in the meantime, requesting everyone else to just keep putting your questions in the chat box. Rini and Shreya are just going to compile all your questions and share those with me and Himant. Then we're just going to try and answer that uh, past 440 or so. Before that, we do have a couple of questions that we would like to cover, uh, you know, keeping in mind the presentations that we have had so far and also the questions that we've received before the webinar. Uh, and yes, uh, we will be sharing the presentations uh, with you, uh, you know, tomorrow or day after. Just give us a day or two to share all these presentations with you. Uh, in the meantime, you can go through SKI's products that I've linked up uh, in the chat box here as well. Um, so just quickly keeping an eye, are you back? Yes, I'm back. Can you hear me? Great. Could you, uh, can we just do a quick audio check just to ensure that we can hear your voice okay? Yeah. Can you hear me, Lekia? Is it yes, clear? Yes, this is perfect. Yeah, no, this is perfect. It's perfect. Great. Um, so I think that uh, addresses, you know, where the social stock exchange is currently, how many folks have registered, how many folks you know, are on their path to actually get listed uh, and all of that. So one question um, I did have is given, you know, we've spoken about social stock exchange and what potential it holds. Would love to understand from you, like from my understanding and from the little I've read about social stock exchange and done some research, I understand it has the potential to bring in efficiency in the impact ecosystem through ma three main points, right? Like from my perspective, one being that it streamlines the reporting and the compliance, and this includes both for the investors and the social organizations as well, because it provides a unified reporting framework and a list of vetted nonprofits. And that actually also helps in reducing the administrative burdens as well while ensuring transparency and accountability, right, in the utilization of funds. So that's one. Second is enhancing the funding I and mean, amplifying the funding uh, in the long run, as well as the, the data availability, right, when it comes to the impact that's being made. Like similar to how MCA puts out CSR funding data, you know, year on year. Similarly, in the long term, SSC also contributing to enhancing data availability in the impact sector. And this could be by providing information on funding flows from various investors, trends on sectors that are being preferred more, geographies that are receiving more uh, funding, what kind of in instruments you know, are being used, et cetera. It gives us some idea of how the, the non-CSR funding landscape is also uh, you know, looking at funding. Um, and thirdly, it also provides an access to a curated pipeline of social and environmental impact projects for investors. So I want to understand from you, uh, you know, I mean, while these are my three key takeaways, according to you, what makes social stock exchange a potential game changer, you know, for driving impact in India and also acting as a catalyst for nonprofits and for profits and uh, in, in the development sector. Sure. So uh, there are three or four things that I want to mention on this topic like here. The first is, um, think about, forget about the social stock exchange for the moment, right? What does a stock exchange do? A pure play commercial stock exchange. It allows you and me to sitting at my home, sitting at my computer, A, put in money into any organization anywhere in this country, right? So if my favorite cause was uh conservation of yak in the himalayas right yeah right then i could actually find an ngo in himachal pradesh or in jammu and kashmir sitting in mumbai where i am uh look at their track record and actually put in money into my favorite cause without having to tap into friends family network etc et right seven degrees of separation um second what it allows uh, me to do is that once I've made that investment, it provides me with periodic reporting on how the company that or company that I've invested in 
is performing. Right? And therefore, it provides me full transparency and also future uh, indicators as to whether I should be putting in more money or should I be diverting my money to other causes, right? The, the social stock exchange does something very similar in a more democratized way, right? It and look at it from both the issuer side or an NPO side as well as from a donor side, and equally importantly for a for profit and social enterprise and an investor point of view. So, for MPOs that are looking to tap into funding sources that are beyond what their uh, fundraising people teams can reach, right, without spending money on attending seminars and flying to different parts of the country. Uh, it, it creates a level playing field for any NPO who has a good track record and wants to raise funds, right? And be able to raise funds, not just from their local area, but from any part of the country, right? It also allows, gives them a platform to create a track record and be able to demonstrate the good work they're doing. And similarly, from a, a donor or investor perspective, it allows access to like that YAC, uh, uh, the cause I mentioned, right? It allows them to access uh, and it allow, gives them periodic reporting on what is happening and allows them to decide whether they want to continue uh, supporting such and such cause or such and such organization or they need to look elsewhere. Right? The sec the, the, that's one aspect. Now, the other aspect, and it's related to the first one, uh, the other aspect is that um, there is a whole host of distributors that exist today. Right? These distributors allow a, an, a, any organization wanting to raise funds to tap into what, I, I forget what the latest number is, some five crore or seven crore investors across the country, right? Your HDFC securities and ICIC securities and Zero Da and all these gun, etc. My and uh, it's a part of what where I when I peer into the crystal ball where I see us going is my uh, the future would be where each of these distributors would have as a part of their asset allocation right a window which says social giving right so. And like with asset allocation changing over time, I'll probably start giving more or less depending on how I feel into that window of social giving, right? And it would be able to show that currently open issues which are accepting funds are such and such. And therefore you can pick the area, the, uh, the, the area and uh, the cause that you're, you're wanting to put in money into, and then you will be able to donate money and then track, remember, it's very important that I'm able to track and get transparency. The third is that, um, and you briefly touched upon this uh, in your presentation lecture, is that, and I, I think I spoke about it in my introductory remarks also, the innovative part of social finance right, is currently restricted to a closed circle of entities, institutions, organizations, whatever you want to call them. Right. So if there's a, if I don't know how many of you have heard that there are actually five social development bonds in India. Right. I don't know how many of you heard who issued them, who subscribed to them. Right. What is the structure? How does it work? What the social stock exchange allows you to do, just like it allows you to participate in any profit making journey that's happening. Right? It actually allows you and me, like here, you and me, to actually contribute money to structures like this. It's important for us because yeah. it allows us to participate in more innovative financing initiatives. And it's also important for the person who's, who's the issuer, right? Because they then don't have to, currently, the cost of raising capital for some of these more esoteric types of instruments is quite high, right? Because of the effort it takes to put them together, especially the risk investor and the outcome funder and what have you, right? We are looking at being able to, again, create a platform through which that can be done systemically rather than having to, to be done on a transaction basis and allowing you and me to participate in that journey. Yeah. 
Yeah. I think just taking forward uh, from from your point on you know it becoming part of our whole asset allocation uh, you know portal right like in the future just taking from there as well how do you see ssc evolving over the next let's say 3 years versus 5 years versus 10 years down the line and i'm going to try combining a bunch of points into this question as well because i know we're getting a lot of questions in the chat box too but in the way of let's say the innovative financing aspects that we are talking about right i know currently we have certain instruments on social stock exchange that uh, that you know have that have adopted some of the blended finance instruments as well so you can touch upon those and also let us know how it's going to evolve to uh, really unlock diverse forms of capital you know towards a single project as well and make it more impact oriented and uh, you know outcomes oriented Second, also, what potential does social stock exchange have in supporting and accelerating innovation and entrepreneurship in India? You know, and given that, you know, you also run an accelerator of your own from your perspective, uh, you know, what, in, you know, in what manner can social stock exchange, instead of just looking at supporting grants, you know, could it also look at supporting incubators, accelerators, you know, and this could be hosted within an organization or outside or supporting entrepreneurs, right, in, in helping them with their innovation journey. Third, there was also a question in the Q&A form as well, you know, is uh, for an organization that is research and advocacy oriented, you know, can, I mean, yes, they might meet the eligibility criteria, but are they allowed to endless research projects on social stock exchange and get funding for those? So we're talking about various catalytic levers over there, over here, right? So one of the catalytic levers being innovative finance, second being accelerating innovation uh, and entrepreneurship, third being, uh, you know, building capacity of nonprofits, like how do you build future readiness of nonprofits you know, in the long term so that if another COVID happens, you know, how can our nonprofits be more resilient? So building capacity of nonprofits right from the get-go, doing research and advocacy, building public infrastructure. So anything that has to do not just grants, but outside, right? Like how do you think social stock exchange is going to evolve over the next few years to actually make all of this happen and, uh, you know, and for development, for, to help philanthropists, you know, adopt these catalytic levers as well? <clears throat> That's a tall order. <laughs> um, okay. So, uh, one is that uh, what you're looking at from a social stock exchange viewpoint is version 1.0, right? It's uh, our current focus on uh, zero coupon, zero principle instruments is partly deliberate because we do want to get it off the ground and running, right? And that's the easiest way to do it. However, I think the true power of a stock exchange uh, does not lie in enabling donations and grants. It, it's uh, uh, it's there's an existing process, there's an existing uh, environment that works reasonably well. Uh, what it allows, like I was mentioning earlier, is to actually allows uh, fundraising organizations to reach a much larger audience rather than being restricted. But the um, what what a stock exchange does really well is at a reasonably low cost, it allows people with the same objective but with different natures to come together and achieve a common objective. Okay, what am I talking about? I'm saying that so if you take a social impact bond, right, as a typical example, uh, a social impact bond has a risk investor who's looking to put in money into a project and earn a financial return yeah now today uh, and then there's an outcome funder who eventually on successful completion of the project provides the funding for the entire exercise right now today to be able to garner the risk investors the the, the uh, outcome funders right all of that requires a tremendous amount of cost and effort and it leaves out so if you go, uh, uh, it leaves out a large part of people who are a part of the philanthropic ecosystem in the country from this entire equation, right? Yeah. For multiple reasons. One is if a social impact bond guy had to actually reach out to a million people, they'll end up spending a shitload of money in doing so, right? And it'll take a tremendously long amount of time. By then, the need of the project is probably gone. Um, so what the social 
stock exchange allows you to do is actually allows you to get all these different players together very quickly at a very low transaction cost and allows a greater amount of participation. You go back to your slide about uh, philanthropic capital being 60,000 crores, right? Yeah. Um, out of that, CSR was only 25,000 crores, right? 30,000 crores was the high net worth individuals. Yeah, yeah. And there was a small sliver at the bottom, which was the formal giving by individuals at 5,000 crores. Believe me, the, the size of that small sliver in reality, if you include the informal part, yeah, Maybe it's huge. Much, right? Much bigger than those other two combined. Yeah. Why is it informal? Because today there doesn't exist a platform that okay. allows them to, right? Right now, most of that money is either going into temples, which probably most of it will continue because that's very goal oriented. But, um, but there is a fair amount which goes informally into organizations, which it doesn't get recorded, doesn't get measured. Yeah. Those, those people don't even know whether they're getting any impact out of the work they're doing. The social stock exchange allows that all that capital to now come, allows that capital to not only go into zero coupon, zero principal instruments, it allows it to go into social development bonds, it blended finance instruments, subordinated debt, whatever you want to call it. Right. So the, the role that social stock exchange plays is not to create innovation that you and I do, right? A sattva does that or you know, individuals do that. Yeah. The role that the social stock exchange plays is in allowing that innovation to actually become successful. Mm. Right. It allows you to not do an experiment with a social impact bond and see if it works. It allows you to actually create a series of social impact bonds and you can be reasonably sure it will work. Right. The, the other thing is that um, from a... Um, Social from a stock exchange viewpoint, no, uh, I I don't think uh, to uh, to some extent people don't understand blended finance. People understand donations. Right? Mm. People don't understand blended finance. For them, donation is giving. Right, fill it, shut it, forget it. Right, and therefore they perhaps from an asset allocation viewpoint, they allocate a small part of their pie to that bucket, right? Now, if you could actually convince them through these mm. innovations that no, it's not just about giving, right? Yeah. You also get measurements. Returns. Yeah, returns. Yeah. Then imagine the size of that pie. The, 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 what you said in the initial part of your blended finance presentation, right? About how it unlocks a much larger pool of capital by having risk and uh, social capital come together. The social stock exchange allows you to do that in a practical sense, hmm. not just uh, on paper. Right. So my mind, uh, I take the example of a social venture fund. We haven't talked yeah. too much about the social venture. Yeah. Fund. A social venture fund is, like I was saying earlier, think of it as a mutual fund, which allows you to invest into a basket of underlying instruments. So let's say. And I'm from uh, Mumbai, so I'll take the example of Maharashtra. Let's say, and water is a is a scarce commodity in large parts of Maharashtra, right? So let's say there are twenty initiatives across Maharashtra that are working in various ways of water conservation, recycling, whatever. Um, and you, as a donor or an investor, depending on the instrument, want to participate in that journey. Right. Today, there is no mechanism that allows you, apart from giving money individually to those 20. Right? What if there was a social venture fund that actually was investing in this underlying basket of 20 projects? Right? That would allow you to participate holistically into water conservation in the entire state of Maharashtra. Right? Or you could take, instead of a geography, you could take a sector. Yeah. Right? And so on and so forth. So, the point I'm trying to make is innovation is something we do. Mm. The stock exchange acts as an enabler for that innovation. Yeah. It yeah. provides the capability for you to actually make it successful and scalable. Yeah. No, I think those are really great points. So I think great point on social stock exchange being an enabler, you know, while the whole ecosystem evolves and, you know, uh, does innovation, entrepreneurship, 
you know, blended finance, research, uh, everything, right? Um, and one other point I think was a key takeaway for me also is, you know, while they're still talking about the ma major pie, right, which is your h &Is and the CSR, so also not talking about individual givers enough, you know, people like you and me, also a huge potential for us to use social stock exchange, you know, to start uh, supporting social causes and huge potential for social stock exchange to start moving that informal, uh, informal individual giving, you know, into a more formal uh, mode. And by the way, some data point there is informal giving is 90% of formal giving. So it's a huge pie, uh, you know, if you were to look at it. Um, just I, I, one last question from my side, I'm just going to open it up to, you know, all the audience over here in the chat box as well as uh, just from your conversations with all the nonprofits and perhaps some of the for profits as well so far, you know, through their registration process. What are some of the questions that you have been receiving from them? And uh, some amount of healthy skepticism is great, right? But w w what are those points where you're being questioned, you know, on how on social stock exchange and how you're going about addressing those uh, for nonprofits? And just adding on to that question as well, what are some of the challenges that you have seen nonprofits facing through this process? And what's, what are some of the best practices that you've seen them adopting? Or what are those mitigation strategies that you have at your end uh, in helping them through the process? Um, so I, I'll take the second one first, like yeah, yeah. Um, and I, actually, I'm giving a conditioned response because it's only been about six, seven months, eight, actually nine months now. Time flies when you're having fun. Um, yeah. <laughs> so and it's very early days, right? We've just had our first listing, which will have open soon. Yeah. Uh, so uh, they uh, normally uh, the the Two or three, uh, the two or three questions that keep coming up is one is will a stock exchange help me in raising funds, right? So um, to take uh, and the, the quick answer is no, right? Uh, the stock exchange will not help you raise funds. Uh, the stock exchange cannot uh, okay. promote individual issues. It it's a neutral platform uh, that is across. All issues. Um, you um, the uh, and we didn't speak about the advocacy and uh, right that part. So uh, as long as your advocacy etc is oriented towards the specific sectors that are there in the list of sixteen, right? I, I think you can register onto the social stock exchange. Um, the uh, currently eighty uh, G. Certificates cannot be given to donors who have gone through the social stock exchange. Uh, it's something that we are working with uh, the Ministry of Finance. And I'm hoping, keeping my fingers crossed, that we will have that happen real soon. We, uh, As recent as last week, there was a meeting in Delhi that I was there. And I think things are getting ironed out there. So real soon, hopefully, ATG will any get enabled. <laughs> uh, CSR also today is not available for CSR donors to put money on yeah. the stock exchange. And I think compared to ATG, um, uh, CSR actually has is a little more complicated, especially given now you have that uh, escrow account and then yeah. you have that carry forward not being allowed and that restriction over three years, etc. Um, so uh, that might take a little longer. That's another question that comes up very frequently. But again, we are working with the Ministry of Corporate Affairs on making that happen. I, I'm assuming there will be some kind of a conditional approval yeah. with some restrictions. Uh, but that might take a little bit of time. Uh, FCRA is not allowed on the platform right now, mm -hmm. right? Uh, which I think is a more long-term battle. I think we'll have to prove our metal first before... We, I mean, the way I often talk about it is that some of the radical changes to the FCRA Act are around transparency of end user funds, right, ultimately. And if they, you have a platform that gives you full transparency of end user funds, you should actually be telling everybody on the FCRA side to come through the social stock exchange. Mm -hmm. But I think that day will come. Uh, yeah. We have to prove ourselves first. Um, what else? I think that you know that sixty-seven percent 
which needs to be certified by a chartered accountant. Yeah. That often takes time because chartered accountants or auditors of NPOs are not normally operating at a project level or at a very granular level, right? They're looking at more books of accounts and debits and credits. So that sometimes takes a little bit of time and explaining also uh, to overcome. But the rest of it is reasonably standard stuff. Listing, I'm not commenting because, like I said, it's been only one. So yeah. I think maybe we have we should have another chat three to six months down the road and I can give a more educated yeah. answer. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, the chat is firing up over here. So just picking up some questions from here. There's a question from Aparna who says for groups uh, such as uh, farmer producer organizations and self-help groups. And I know you and I keep talking about this example. So, you know, the, the organizations who do not fit into the eligibility criteria of 50 lakhs spending, 10%, uh, sorry, uh, 10 lakhs uh, funding, you know, every eligibility criteria. But how can they benefit uh, from the current social stock exchange? And given that, you know, they're also not able to meet potentially the reporting requirements as well. Or do you see this happening sometime down the line? So uh, FPOs or SAGs are uh, normally constitutors or cooperatives or yeah. uh, private limited companies, right? Yeah, correct. Um, so um, private limited companies, uh, so and the 50 lakh, etc., remember, are for not-for-profit non right? so FPOs don't necessarily come into that, uh, those restrictions. But as a private limited company, you would go on the FPE side of the graph, right? And therefore, you would have to meet the norms currently available for those, um, which, uh, as far as I know, 90-95% of the FPOs in this country would not be able to meet the listing criteria of whatever mm -hmm. the few 15 crores of net worth, etc. Right? So a smarter way to do it would be for actually uh, an entity to create, um, for the lack of a better word, a, a fund of FPOs. Rather, and plus, for an individual FPO, I think the the compliance requirements may become a little too onerous and will yeah. take away the any benefit that Correct. is received from uh, being on the social stock exchange. One option, and you know, I'm I've not thought this one through, but I'm throwing it out there, is for actually somebody to create a a, a fund of FPOs, you know, a group mm -hmm. of FPOs, a larger entity. Uh, that can then actually uh, do fundraise for the individual members and then, you know, that structure might work better than individual FPOs coming on to the stock exchange. It sounds good. I think the next question uh, that we have over here is, I'm just going back to the sheet as well, uh, is what role would uh, SEBI play in enabling fundraising process for nonprofits? So would nonprofits need to rally support on their own? I know we spoke about social stock exchange, you know, not supporting with fundraising. So I'm assuming the answer is the same here for yeah, SEBI yeah. as well, right? Yeah. Great. Uh, the next question is, uh, I'm just checking over here. Just give me a minute. I'm just checking. So, okay. Shira, I can just also check the chat box directly as well. Uh, there's a very good question by Anisha over here. I know we spoke about financial returns, um, you know, for potentially investors. But the question here is, what are some of those incentives for donors and investors, you know, of looking at social stock exchange versus, you know, giving to nonprofits directly? Um, and is it primarily opportunities to create impact or, you know, along with that, some monetary benefit as well? And this question is both on non-profit and for-profit side. Actually, uh, if you don't mind, uh, can I read the question? Uh, this sure. is it was Anisha, right? Yes, I'm pasting the question back over here again. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, there's also a question by Srinivas while you're looking at this question as well from APD. Uh, he also had a very similar question on uh, CSR funds as well, but I think that's been addressed. He has a follow-up question uh, on can a registered nonprofit issue ZC, ZP notes uh, without mentioning a specific project, but to fund the general operations of the nonprofit? So the short answer to that one is uh, uh, yes, you can. Uh, there's no restriction on the stock exchange that you have to do it uh, for a particular uh, 
uh, yeah, as long as the ultimately the proof of the pudding is in finding somebody to put money into your instrument right if you have people who are willing to fund your corpus or general operations sure you can okay i have anisha's question in front of me yeah. what do the donors investors get uh, uh, if you are anisha if you're referring to a zero coupon zero principal instrument the donors and uh, investors get exactly what a donor would get with a donation or a grant they get social impact for the money that they're putting in um, uh, we, I'm assuming that we go for a specific objective. Uh, no different from that. The social stock exchange doesn't en enable anything else. Uh, is the primary opportunity is to create impact or some of the monetary benefits? Again, the question answer stays the same. So if it's a zero coupon, zero principal instrument you're talking about, it is a donation or a grant, right? There is no monetary benefit. But if you're looking at a social development bond or some other kind of structure, Sure, it can deliver both impact and monetary benefit. Yeah, I know we have only three minutes. So I'm going to take two to three more questions. The first question is by uh, Shushant on, does the organization need to open a separate DMAT account or the existing one can be coupled with it? Sorry, sorry, say that again. Sorry, we yes. cannot hear you. What did you just say? I didn't hear. Yeah, does the organization need to open a separate DMAT account or the existing one can be coupled with it? I'm assuming this is from somebody who wants to raise funds on the social stock exchange, right? Yes, so yes. Technically, the person who's doing the fundraise doesn't need a DMAT account, right? The people who are actually buying the, uh, the zero coupon, zero principle or the bond or whatever, they are the people who need a DMAT account. Great. Uh, there's a question from Sudhir, which is a slightly different question, but to just add on to it, you know, are there any investors who have already you know, thinking of investing in SSE, like do we already have a pipeline of investors who are already interested? I'm sure. So uh, there are some who have committed funds to the first few issues on the social stock exchange. Um, but uh, the stock exchange doesn't maintain a registry of investors per se. So we would not know, apart from this informal communication about some people who have committed to kickstarting the social stock exchange through funds. Got it. Uh, there's a question from Krishnan, and I'm going to take this as the last question. Uh, unfortunately, we're out of time, but uh, this also to I'm just trying to take as many nonprofit uh, related questions as possible because I think we spoke a lot about demand. Uh, I mean, the supply side, right, which is the funding ecosystem. Uh, so the last question from Krishnan is: Once a nonprofit gets listed, how do they reach out to potential investors and donors to subscribe? Um, and he's asking this question because, uh, you know, according to his experience, there have been regular front page ads in newspapers, you know, there's been social media promotions, etc. But once listed, how can nonprofits, uh, you know, uh, get uh, investors, you know, and to potentially subscribe to their projects? Sorry, um, let me just, uh, oh. so you're saying that you have raised funds through a zero coupon zero principal instrument already and now you're doing a follow-on uh, zero coupon zero principal and trying to find investors uh, maybe Krishnan can I've put the question uh, so what Krishnan is asking is once non-profit I mean lists a project that he's mentioned the non-profits get listed but when they list a project how do they reach out to potential investors and donors to subscribe yeah, so this again, uh, the, the stock exchange will not help you, unfortunately, right? So you are most welcome to do newspaper ads. Uh, you're most welcome to do uh, social media promotions, reach out to your existing network of investors. Uh, the idea is, so uh, creating this initial uh, ecosystem will require individual efforts for fundraising for the first few people. However, as they build a track record, and as we get the distributors on board, and Krishnan, I think you called it a utopia. Um, as we do all of that, then it will become, you know, self-propelling. Then it will not need the current manual intervention that is required. But until we get there, we will have to do individual fundraisers. We will have to talk to investors directly. Sounds good. I think I'm extremely sorry, everyone, but those are the questions that we can take for the day. For the rest of the questions, what we're going to do is compile all of them 
and Heman, sir, what we can do is we can share those questions offline with you and we could figure out a way to go back to everyone over here, you know, sure. with the uh, answers from your end. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Heman, sir. Thank you so much, everyone over here for giving your time. Uh, we will stay in touch. Please keep an eye out for uh, SKI's products, uh, you know, on Capital for Impact, as well as any developments that might happen, you know, on Social Stock Exchange by following Heman Gupta, sir, on LinkedIn. Uh, but that's all for today. Thank you so much. Uh, we will also share uh, Heman Sir's ID, email ID with uh, all of you uh, offline. Okay. Thank you thank so you. much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Sir. Bye. Bye. It was a very well-structured session. Bye-bye. Great. Thank you. Bye.